Good morning. It's good to have you with us here today. This is Narco Christian Church Worship Online for May 17th, 2020. I am so glad to have you here today and watching our worship online. First of all, I want to say how much I appreciate your faithfulness for watching every week and being with us, keeping us somewhat together virtually, uh, but virtually just isn't good enough. And so we are going to begin our services here on campus on May 31st. Now, why May 31st? Because that is the celebration of the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was 50 days after the Passover. The Jews celebrated that feast. The church began on that day in Jerusalem in 32 AD, and we are going to celebrate that together once again as we reopen the doors of our church. So I hope that you'll plan to be with us. That service will be at nine o'clock. We will eventually go back to our two services the following week, but for that service on May 31st, as we celebrate Pentecost, we want us to all celebrate together. We will probably try to be outdoors. If the weather is good, if it gets too hot, we'll meet inside, turn the air conditioner on, and let you enjoy the service that morning. It was just a couple of hours after I made that announcement to you last week that the County of Riverside relax some of their restrictions and allows groups of 50 to meet together. I will give you some more of that information at the end of this uh, service and what our restrictions will be. We want to meet safely and we want you to feel comfortable while you are at the service on May 31st. So we'll be talking more about that at the end of the service. Right now, I want to tell you where I'm going with my preaching today. I'm going to be preaching from Acts, the first chapter. Now, the reason I'm going to do that is because on May 31st, we're going to celebrate Pentecost. We're going to celebrate the beginning of the church. The record of that beginning is in Acts, the second chapter. And I want to lead in to that, um, to that chapter with my preaching today and next week. And so today I'm going to be preaching from the first chapter and then the second half of the first chapter next week. So I hope you'll get your Bibles, have those ready, and we will be studying from that in just a moment. Right now... I would like for you to take time to bow your hearts and your heads for a word of prayer. I have asked Gib Tipton to come, lead us in a word of prayer at this time. So Gib, will you come and lead our hearts in prayer? Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day that we can worship you, Lord. And we just ask you to be with everyone in Norco Christian Church here as we listen to Alton's sermon, preaching your good news, Lord, of the gospel. We just thank you for the opportunity to keep worshiping you during this um, coronavirus nightmare. We ask you to be with the doctors, give, be with their, give them a helping hand in learning how to deal with this. We'd ask you to, looking forward to fixing this to where we can all get back to Norco Christian Church in the fellowship that we love here. We just ask you to be with everyone here at Norco Christian Church, the elders, the deaconesses, the body of believers. We just ask you to keep us safe during this, these trying times, and we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Who? 
shine like stars. Jesus is coming back. Now, I am not trying to say in any way to connect what is going on in this world today with the return of Jesus. I just want to lead us into the message of Pentecost Sunday on May 31st. I hope you will plan to come meet with us and celebrate our freedom in Christ that day and our freedom to gather together and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Acts 1, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was still eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The first thing that I want to have you noticed this morning about this passage of Scripture is that Luke makes it clear that the instructions that were given to the apostles were done so by the aid of the Holy Spirit. That would be, in simple terms, the Spirit of God. What this implied was that those instructions were inspired by the voice of God. Those instructions were given to the disciples by the inspiration of God. Paul wrote to Timothy a similar passage about the Old Testament scriptures available to them at the time. I'm going to read that scripture from the Old King James Version. Sometimes the Old King James Version just does the job. And here it does it well. 2 Timothy 3.16 all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The New International Version gives us a more literal version of that same verse by saying, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every Scripture is God-breathed. The words... God breathed in Greek is one word. It is a compound word, theopneumatos. It is made up of theos, which is the word for God in Greek, and pneumatos, which is the word for breathe or breath in Greek. 
It is the Greek word from which we get our English word pneumonia. I'm sure that at some time in your life you have asked the question, at least of yourself, either directly or indirectly, why in the world do we put a P in front of pneumonia? And we pronounce it pneumonia rather than P pneumonia. Now, the English answer to that is the P is silent. If it is silent, why do we put it there in the first place? Well, the reason is because the Greek word starts with a P, and so we carried it over into our English word. Now, the Greek letter is the same letter that we use in our math to build the equation for the circumference of a circle, pi r squared. In math, we call it pi, but in Greek, we call it p. But in both cases, we write it like two vertical standing sticks and a roof on the top. So now we have our English word pneumonia, an illness or disease of our breathing apparatus. So what the Greek has done is put the word for God and the word for breath together in a literal sense. We have the term God breathed. Every scripture is God breathed. In a more interpretive sense, the old King James says it well, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now I suppose that if you have somehow done away with God in your theology, then inspiration by God won't mean much to you. But for those of you who believe that this world has a glorious and very intelligent designer, and that he is directly concerned about his creation, then the thought that his word to us is divinely inspired will continue to give us hope throughout our life, even in and especially in a day that the world and the media around us has given us so much to fear. I don't know what you can depend on if you don't have God. The advertisements on television recently have tried to tell us that science is dependable. But if that were really true, why are we where we are today? Now, I also realize that the unbeliever could also say to us, if your God is so dependable, why are we where we are? today? My answer to that would be simply this. God gives us a whole different level of dependability. God is so dependable that we don't have to be afraid of death like the world seems to be at this very hour. Luke lets us know that not only is God dependable, but so is his word. Luke points out to us in the very beginning words of Acts that the instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples were God-breathed. The instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples had their source in the Holy Spirit the word spirit here in Acts 1 is the same pneumatos, the same word as pneumonia, the same word as breathe or breath. In a very literal sense, Luke is saying here that Jesus was taken up into heaven after he had given them the instructions that were divinely breathed. Holy Spirit given. In other words, 
the source of those instructions were from the breath of God, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to tell us what happened shortly afterwards. I'm going to talk briefly about three of those things. Three reasons we should shine like stars for the kingdom of God. The first reason that we should shine like stars is because Jesus appeared alive after his death and resurrection. Shine like stars. Jesus appeared alive for 40 days after his resurrection. Luke says, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. The beginning of the book of Acts is a message of assurance. It is a message of assurance that not only is God's word inspired, but the things that are written in it are true and dependable. Luke uses the word convincing proofs. And I must point out that here the term convincing proofs is one word in the Greek. In this case, it is not a compound word. It is simply a word which emphasizes the truth about something. It is a word that means that the facts that are stated are infallible. In fact, the translation could be stated this way. He showed himself to these men and gave them many infallible proofs. In fact, that is the way that the King James Version translates it. What was it that made the proof so infallible? The fact that he appeared to so many people so many times. The resurrection of Christ might have been an emotionally psychological phenomena for one person who just wanted to see Jesus alive one more time. But he appeared to several groups of women. He appeared to the 11 disciples plus several others who were in the room. And at least two different occasions he appeared to them. Once when Thomas was not present and another time when Thomas was present. And then there was Thomas himself who said that he would not believe unless he saw with his eyes. Eventually Jesus set those doubts aside. He appeared to the group of disciples who went fishing, you remember. They fished all night long and caught nothing, and Jesus told them what to do. And they caught 153 fish by moving their net to the other side of the boat. And there is the record that Luke gives us of two men who are walking to the city of Emmaus, just seven miles from Jerusalem, and Jesus appeared to them, but they didn't even recognize him at first. And now Luke points out to us that these kinds of experiences happened over and over again for a period of almost a month and a half before Jesus was taken up into the clouds once again to sit at the right hand of God. Shine like stars. Jesus appeared alive for 40 days after his resurrection. The appearances of Jesus after his resurrection makes his resurrection even more significant because it puts an end to the possibility that his resurrection was in any way contrived. And so my second point says this. Shine like stars, but don't stand around gazing into the sky. Luke records it this way. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, 
Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father had set within his own authority, but you, re- you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, up on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, then Luke tells us that Jesus ascended into the clouds and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky when two men in white appeared to them. Evidently, these two men are angels. It seems that they were amazed and stunned that Jesus left them by ascending into the clouds. And the scripture says, and a cloud hid him from their sight. I suppose it would have been a purely human thing to do. To stand gazing into the sky where you saw Jesus disappear. And to ponder what all of that meant. Luke has just reminded us that Jesus had given them orders as part of the God-breathed instructions that he had given them that they were to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And here they were staring into the sky. Now, staring into the sky isn't a bad thing in itself. In fact, so many people miss beautiful sunsets because they don't stare into the sky. They miss the beautiful stars of the sky. They miss the beautiful clouds that form before and during rainstorms. I often stare into a starry sky when I'm out taking pictures of the Milky Way. One thing that I want so badly to be able to do right now, this time of year, is to be out taking pictures of the Milky Way. This is the time of year to be taking those pictures, but on top of being urged not to travel, I just don't have time to do it. Maybe by June or July, or perhaps August, I'll be able to get some more of those starry pictures. But here are the disciples staring intently, the scripture says, into the clouds where they saw Jesus disappear. While they were doing so, two men in white, evidently angels, appeared to them and broke their fixation on the event. It took two angels to bring the apostles' minds back to earth. The appearance of those two men in white was very intentional. I'm sure that those apostles were thinking, he's gone. Now what are we going to do? And the men in white reminded them what Jesus had already said to them. It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes up on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are not told that these two men in white repeated those words again, but their very presence brought back sober minds to the apostles, and they remembered what Jesus had said to them, I'm sure. We, like the disciples of Jesus, should shine like stars, but we should not get caught up in the glory of the moment that we stand around doing nothing for Him. Don't forget the Church of Christ still has that responsibility to be witnesses for Christ in our Jerusalem, wherever that may be and in our Samaria, and in our Judea, and to the ends of the earth. That's why our mission support is so important 
and vital to our church's spiritual health. Too many churches are like the new employee who had been caught coming in late for work three times in a row. And the fourth morning, the foreman decided to read him the riot act. Look here, snapped the foreman. Don't you know what time we start to work around here? The employee, the new employee said, No, sir, they're always working when I get here. <laughs> and so we should shine like stars for Jesus because he's coming back. And the third point that I want to make is we should shine like stars because Jesus will be back. Luke records, this same Jesus who had been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. That's what the two men said to the apostles. He's coming back again in the same way you saw him go. Now, there may be a lot of different opinions in the theological world about what Jesus is going to do when he does come back. There's a lot of different opinions about how long he's going to stay and even about what he's going to say. But the one thing that we can agree is that the Scripture does say he will come back in the same way the apostles saw him go. And that's in the clouds. 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning at verse 14, says, We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. In other words, those who have died. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds and meet the Lord and the air. And so will we be with the Lord forever. How long? Forever. Therefore, the Apostle Paul says at the end of that fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, encourage one another with these words. What will he find us doing when he returns? Will we be gazing into the sky? Or will we be found serving? What would he say? What would he say if he should come today and find my hands so full of future plans, however fair, in which my Savior has no share? What would he say? What would he say if he should come today and find my love so cold, my faith so very weak and dim, I had not even looked for him? What would he say? What would he say if he should come today and find that I had not told one soul about my heavenly friend, whose blessings all my way attend. What would he say? What would he say if he should come today? Would I be glad, quite glad, remembering that he died for all, and none through me had heard his call? What would he say? Shine like stars. 
Jesus is coming back. We should shine like stars because we have convincing proof that Jesus was alive after his death. We should shine like stars because we should not stand gazing into the sky, but be about his work. We should shine like stars because we have been assured that he is coming back. I hope you'll shine like stars because you too know that Jesus is coming back. God bless you, and I hope you continue to be happy on your way to heaven.